Hi, y'all. I'll be responding to Autopsy's response to my video to him about his video on gun control. Autopsy, thank you for the video. I want to address uh, some points, and some I'm not going to address in this video. I'll do it in a separate video. Um, but before we get started, I need to make a correction from my previous video when I was talking about the homicide rates in Australia. An alert viewer, I'll put a link to it below. Uh, checked behind me, which I encourage, and uh, brought to my attention that uh, there is an error. The the homicide rate in Australia today is not exactly the same as it was in the early 90s. Now, I want you to close your eyes and imagine with me that someone has just knocked on your door, you open the door, and it's a police officer, and they tell you, uh, sir, ma'am, I'm sorry to tell you that your insert favorite loved one here has been the victim of a homicide, and let it resonate in your mind what it is you believe you have just been told. In the English-speaking world, uh, you would have just been told that your favorite loved one has been killed. Apparently, in the Australian government, you can be a victim of homicide and survive it. Who knew? So, uh, in the English-speaking world, homicide means you've been killed, but uh, in some years that they put out their statistics, uh, they count as, in their homicide victims, as homicide victims, uh, everyone who was killed and everyone who was attempted to be killed but survived it. So uh, the real figure is not 1.9 as I said, it is in fact 1.2 and I wrote out the decimal points here to point out that the error uh, between the true figure and what uh, they, they by folding in these attempted murders and whatnot is uh, it is an error that is seven parts in a million. That's where the changes here are happening. They're happening in the millionth spot. Okay, anyway, uh, it is a small difference but it is a difference all the same. All right, Autopsy, so um, I want to accept your, uh, your concession on the solely point as opposed to saying primarily or the major purpose or something along those lines. The only point I wanted to uh, make there is that um, I'm already on my guard when I talk to gun control advocates uh, because you're arguing for a curtailment of my liberties, so I'm, aut I'm automatically not trusting uh, what, what I'm going to be told. And it's not helped along any when, on a point like this, you, you, either through careless language, which I'll grant is your uh, excuse or your reason, or uh, through dishonesty, which is what I think generally it is, when you say something like, it's solely this, when it really isn't. This is the same reason that I find it really annoying when Wayne LaPierre from the NRA goes around saying, the uh, only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. That's just not true. Um, it is an effective way, very often, but it is not the only way, and he should not say it because it is not true. Okay, anyway, um, so just more on that, on that uh, kind of my not trusting what I'm being told. Whenever I talk to gun control advocates, or fetishists, as I call them, there is always a pregnant pause on what it is that they're saying. You know, they'll, they'll say things like, oh, we're only talking about reasonable regulations, dot, dot, dot for the moment, that is always the other shoe to drop, or what I'm uh, hearing from them when, when they talk, particularly because of the various places you'll point in the world. Oh, well, look at Japan. Oh, look at England. Look at Australia, or look at the Netherlands, or you know where, wherever in the world you want to point to. Well, I'm not a, a politically astute person. I don't pay a great deal of attention to politics throughout the world, uh, but I'm I pay enough attention to catch like some major things that do happen in other countries, partic uh, and in particular, some of the countries that uh, gun control advocates will point to. And when I say that the terminus of this line of argument of theirs, after you know, given the history in the United States of a more than a century of this kind of regulation, really the end goal of it is will be a near ban for all firearms for all law-abiding citizens. Uh, but it'll it'll go even further than that. So autopsy. Suppose that I give you. Every, every point that you want. I will concede to every law that you could possibly want. want. Your side will still not be happy. You, and your side can't be made happy because what you, maybe not you in particular, but a large number of people on your side of the argument, what they want is really a bubble-wrapped world. They want the unobtainable. So suppose I give you everything that you want and uh, we could get in a time machine and come back to the United States or come forward to the United States a hundred years from now and the type of arguments that you would see happening in, in the legislatures will be just like this. Thursday morning. The government has rightly introduced minimum custodial sentences for people convicted of threatening someone with a knife. 
But would the Prime Minister agree with me that it is time to introduce a legal assumption that people carrying a knife intend to use it and should attract a prison sentence so that we can redouble our efforts to rid our communities of the scourge of knives? Yeah. So I'm sure if uh, you know you live in the United States, if you lived here all of your life, grew up here, whatever, that that shit sounds like extreme far. I mean, like far, far left extremism. Uh, we need to ban that. We need to address the scourge of knives. We'll have a presumptive law that if you possess one, you intend to commit a crime with it, and uh, that you are presumed to intend to commit a crime in the future means that you are already guilty of a crime and you should spend some lengthy period of time in prison. The difficulty is that that is the Conservative Party. That's Morris, you know, member of Parliament there you saw, but uh, in the lower left-hand corner, the guy you were looking at, that's Jacob Reese mogg He is referred to uh, often enough as the member of Parliament for the early 20th century. That is the right wing in England. Their right wing is like center-left and maybe a little bit over in the United States. So really, when I watch English politics, it's very often listening to fruit flag and it's very often listening to you know like uh, the center and further left argue with the far far left it, to call that conservative uh, conservatism is a joke anyway so in regards to your commentary on why a criminal will desist uh, and that it is related to the purpose of the firearm uh, when you're addressing my part of talking about the presentation of deadly force that is just to concede the deterrence argument the more immediate the the more real it becomes that this could cost that criminal his or her life, the greater the deterrent effect is. Now, um, accepting that once they see, once the presentation of deadly force uh, will persuade them to desist because they appreciate the nature of their circumstances, it's a relatively trivial affair to uh, realize that if criminals generally uh, believe that um, engaging in certain criminal conduct will uh, often cost them their lives, that uh, there will be some deterrent effect there. What that would look like, I have no idea. Uh, so anyway, it's that rational actors generally appreciate their own mortality and seek to avoid unnecessary pain. Uh, that's one of the corollary benefits of which I spoke, and that in, that, that in and of itself is actually uh, a distinct level of force in any level of force hierarchy. It comes right before the use of deadly force. Um, now, very often, the presentation of deadly force is not actually a precursor to the use of deadly force, even if the person doesn't comply. Uh, they hope to scare the person into submission, and when that doesn't work, your bluff has been called, and then you look like an asshole. But anyway, um, it does actually occupy its own level of force. Um, at about 9 minutes 20 seconds in, you're claiming that there's been some reduction in the gun violence that we see because of the uh, automatic weapons restrictions of uh, 1934 National Firearms Act. This is completely not true. Uh, within uh, a year's time, two events happened, well many events happened, but two in particular. Prohibition came to an end in 1933. 1933 was the peak of the homicide rate uh, for that period. And uh, so at the end of 1933, uh, Prohibition went away. The, the last date necessary to ratify uh, the amendment to, to abolish it uh, ratified it, and in December of that year it was abolished. The National Firearms Act did not uh, get enacted into law until the middle part of 1934, and it didn't go into effect for, I can't remember, 60 or 90 days, so it came into effect in uh, August or September, something like that. Now, as you'll notice, the crime rate, had, the homicide rate had already started to drop in 1934, and then that trend continued after 1934. You're claiming that uh, doing the work on the machine guns and whatnot in 1934 is causally related to the reduction in crime. That can't possibly be true for the 1934 Act because the 1934 Act didn't take a single one of those guns out of a single person's hand. Everyone who had a machine gun or the sawed-off shotgun or whatever at the beginning of 1934 had it at the end of 1934. All it did was impose uh, like a tax on transfers and some other... But it wasn't an attempt to, to regulate the, the possession. It wasn't an attempt to get these out of circulation, to get them out of people's hands. It wasn't anything like that. Uh, so it can't possibly be causally related. Um, this is a common trend in statistics. Uh, later on, you're going to show you don't understand this fallacy, but it's uh, called post hoc ergo propter hoc. Um, and it's, as you correctly stated, it's that because one event precedes another event, 
there is an attribution of causation to the previous event such that the latter event is an effect of the previous event. Um, this confuses uh, precedence for cause. Okay, so skipping along, um, you mentioned, uh, oh, there, there, okay, there are other things, but e e uh, suppose that the National Firearms Act was actually trying to get these guns out of people's hands, it still even then would not have been causally related to the reduction in the homicide rate because the guns that were being regulated in that legislation, that were the subject of that legislation, weren't drivers of uh, the homicide rate anyway. This would be a bit like uh, uh, fighting a thousand-headed monster and going and shaving off one of its eyebrows and saying, I have defeated it. I've done great work. No, you didn't. You didn't. Uh, machine guns have never played a prominent role in murders in the United States. Uh, that's not true today. It wasn't true when the National Firearms Act was enacted, and it wasn't true before then. You can count on your hands and feet, uh, your fingers and toes, the number of people who have been documented to have been murdered through uh, machine guns in the United States. It's just not a driver. Uh, this is readily discernible to anybody who's actually played with automatic weaponry, particularly non-crew served automatic weaponry. One thing that uh, all people notice is that they are uh, they're very efficient at sending a lot of bullets in a, in, in a general direction, but they're not very efficient for killing. Uh, they're just not all that accurate. That's why it's called spray and pray. You know, you spray in that general direction and, and you know, hope you hit something that you wanted to hit. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, uh, the example I jotted down when you were talking was I was saying this is like saying that our no longer granting letters of mark and reprisal is causally related to the reduction in the murder rate in that period of time. It just isn't, uh, though it did precede it. This is a common, as I mentioned, a common problem in, in statistics. Uh, a gun control advocate like yourself will show up and say, since this gun law was enacted, uh, gun or various uh, measure of crime X, Y, or Z has gone down. What you fail to do is to look at the trend line before it was enacted. Um, so if you have a trend line that is a, you know, the, the running average is on its way down and then a law is enacted and that, tre that, uh, that trend continues, you come by and say the law causes the latter trend even though it was happening before the law was enacted. Uh, the National Firearms Act was enacted in 34. Uh, as a consequence of um, uh, events that happened in 1929 that did not seem to be replicating themselves. It, it was to address a, a one-off. Anyway, um, about 11 minutes, 33 seconds in, somewhere in there, you say, uh, my, what I wrote down is, I don't much care if you're impressed or unimpressed. I explained why we're being less than cooperative with you. You're talking about whether or not we're inconvenienced. You don't care about that. It's unimpressive. Uh, and, that, and I said, we've reached a, uh, about the limit of where our care about was, what does or doesn't blow your skirt up has been exceeded. Our rights don't rise or fall because you are or are not impressed. At about 12.03, you put up a graphic and ask why it works so well there. I covered this later in my video. Uh, the difference between the United States and those other countries is happening in the 100,000th decimal place instead of the millionth decimal place. So when you talk about these, these uh, Great, great work that's been being done. It simply uh, is. It only appears to be a large amount of work done when you zoom in several orders of magnitude closer, and you're looking at extremely on extremely tiny scales, where you know changes in the the fifth and the sixth and seventh decimal places become salient. That's where these changes happen. Anyway, I wrote us. Uh, Rudely, you should learn a little something called scale. Uh, so, um, if you have a fifth, if you have a fifth of a penny, and I have a whole penny, I have five times the amount of money that you have. We're both broke as fuck. But to run your analogy through, you're the guy with the you know fifth of a penny. You would have to be looking at me, you know, the guy with a whole penny, saying, "My God, he's rich." It's just moronic. It only is apparently large because you have zoomed in so closely that things in the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh decimal places 
start to be noticeable changes anyway. At about 14, 15, uh, your response to the car argument is that uh, you claim that cars, benef that the cars benefit greatly exceeds their cost because they keep our economy going. This is nothing more than an argument that so long as enough people are making money, human lives can be sacrificed. That there is actually a price to be put on human life and uh, we're happy to pay it. So, um, if you're a contract killer out there, your problem, uh, your, your, your moral failing isn't that you murder for hire, it's that you don't charge enough money when you do it. So you get a little bit more money and then it's perfectly fine to go around taking people's lives. That is what an economic argument is. To say that so long as there's financial gain at the end of the road for you, it's okay if many tens of thousands of lives are cast aside. But then on the so that's a uh, to deal with your 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 luxurious lifestyle, your third I'm sorry, your first world lifestyle of uh, ever, you know always wanting to have financial gain and the acquiring of things that that convenience that uh, luxurious lifestyle is not worth inconveniencing even at the expense of thousands, tens of thousands of lives every year but other people's constitutional rights can be pissed away on on the same grounds that you won't accept for for uh, your cars here's a proposal for reasonable car regulation that by the way will save um, almost a hundred percent of all of the lives of people who are killed on America's highways and byways every year. What we could do is require that 100% of cars um, have a governor put on them so they can't exceed 15 or 20, or 20 miles per hour. That will save all of those lives and I guarantee you that you will not accept that inconvenience to your lifestyle because you would have to, oh my god, you'd have to spend much more time traveling to get to work and back home and if you want to go on a vacation it takes a lot longer to get there and to get back, so the time that you can spend enjoying yourself will be less. And after all, those tens of thousands of lives are nothing compared to your convenience. Whereas my rights can be completely obliterated uh, for a smaller number of dead bodies per year. At about 1513, uh, you're talking about we have law enforcement who will find anyone breaking our traffic laws. Anybody who's driven in traffic knows that's bullshit. Um, that we have uh, you know, stop signs and speed limit signs and this and that and this regulation and that that's what's driving the de something like that uh, that's what's driving the decrease in uh, you know keeping our death rates on the on the roadways low this is bullshit there haven't been substantive uh, laws on motor vehicles in the last 30 or 40 years I suppose you could say <coughs> that the change of about 20 years ago from 0.1 to 0.08 for the uh, BAC level, the blood alcohol content. Maybe that's a substantive change. So, two ten two ten thousandth is a substantive change in, in that kind of law. What has uh, caused the reduction in motor vehicle deaths is not new laws on speed or new laws on on uh, um, stop signs. It's engineering that has done this. It's the way that seat belts deform during collisions. It's the way that the cars deform during collisions. You know, the seat belts are designed, they're, in, they're engineered in such a way that they stretch 60% of their total length because as it turns out, uh, you know, a delta V per unit time, it doesn't really matter if what's causing it is your head, you know, you hitting the dashboard or you hitting a strap across your chest. It's the, it, it's the eccentricity of the deceleration that causes the damage. So what you want to do is improve, increase the ride down time. You increase the time through which that change in velocity happens. This is done in a number of ways. Stretchy seat belts, airbags, the second generation, not the first. The first generation were killing people left, right, and center. And the way that the, the energy is dissipated through the car as it deforms throughout the collision. We design cars now, the Society of Automotive Engineers with industry, design cars now in such a way that it's the cars that do the deformation, the bulk of the deformation during a collision event, not the squishy human bodies in them as opposed to uh, the way it was 30, 40 years ago where it was the cars were surviving collisions reasonably well intact but not the occupants. It wasn't new laws uh, on all these things. 
It was smart engineers looking at the engineering problem saying, we have to accept human nature for what it is. People drive in particular ways, and one of the consequences that you can't just get away at uh, letting people go around at these high speeds is that some, some uh, fraction of them are going to crash into each other, and it's going to be uh, catastrophic for those involved. What can we do to mitigate that? That was the solution. Um, also, when you're talking about the licensing on a car, the license is for the use of it in public, on public roads. It's not for the ownership of it. Uh, so I suppose the, the corollary here, if you want to really have an analogous argument, would be that people would have to have a license to shoot their guns on public property. But uh, just like with cars, they should be able to buy and sell them uh, among each other without any restriction at all. Uh, you talk about liability insurance, which elides a critical distinction. Liability is a mitigation of risk for unintended actions. Uh, there is always an intentional injury exception, intentional act exception. Not always, but generally in insurance. Uh, so even if you did impose this for all the, the things that you want to talk about, the murders and the whatnot, uh, and there would be no insurance liability on the part of the company anyway. The bad actor would be liable for it. Um, because what people are really concerned about isn't the couple hundred accidental shootings that happen every year. It's the murders. If I decide to get in my car and mow down a whole bunch of pedestrians, my insurance company doesn't have to pay uh, for, for that act because uh, intentional acts obviate the mitigation of risk because the mitigation of risk works on the proposition that uh, good-natured people trying not to get involved in things will nevertheless fail to be perfect at it and there will be some unintended events. An intentional event obviates, uh, it, it gets rid of the whole uh, system, and that's why there's that exception. Um, oh, uh, mention enforcement. Back. Okay, so you, you want to propose new laws, and you're talking about the ease with which people can buy firearms. One of the things that comes from the gun control advocacy side, and you haven't said this, but a lot of people do, so I'll just address it here, is that um, these background checks weed out at the retail uh, side of the equation, certain number of people getting firearms, and that prevents uh, a certain number of firearms getting in criminals' hands. No, it doesn't. All it does is delay the criminal for a little while. When they realize that they can't get it here, they just go pick it up somewhere else, and then uh, they go off and they commit their crimes with guns, just as they uh, would have done. The reason that this uh, system works the way that it does is because law enforcement, this isn't a legislative problem, this is an executive problem. Law enforcement refuses to make arrests for people who are attempting to unlawfully purchase these firearms at the various stores. Prosecutors, when arrests are taken, refuse to prosecute them because they don't chase the paperwork crimes. They refuse to do it. I mean, every now and again you'll get a prosecution, but typically they refuse to do it. What they do instead is they say, well, we'll let the business transaction part delay this, and then when the criminal gets his hand on a gun and uses it in a future crime, then we'll get involved and go catch the criminal after he's gotten a gun and murdered someone, or shot someone, or robbed someone, or raped someone, uh, we'll address it then because it's important. What we're not going to do is lift a fucking finger and spend one red cent to prosecute them for attempting to unlawfully buy a firearm. A crime, by the way, which is easy as pie to prove in court. The person has to sign something under the pains and penalty of perjury, saying they're not a disbarred person, all disbarred persons know that they're disbarred. They are told it in a court order. There's not one of them who's unaware that they are a prohibited person. They all know it. Easy as pie to get convictions. Prosecutors won't spend a penny to do it. The police won't spend a penny to investigate it, to arrest it. Not, as, they, as they testify to in Congress, it is not worth our time. But give us more of the same kind of laws, which... They didn't say, but I'll finish the syllogism there, which we'll also in the future refuse to enforce because they will also not be worth our time. Um, you claim that cars used by a hell of a lot more people, a uh, hell of a lot more regularly than guns. How do you possibly know that? Uh, I exercise my, my right every day. I don't go anywhere unarmed. Now, I'm not actively shooting my firearm when I'm out in public, but that doesn't mean it's not being put to use in the same way that uh, my... I'm not actively using my firearm, uh, my fire alarm right now in that it's not going off, but it's there serving its purpose, serving its function, notwithstanding the fact there's no fire in my home. My firearm on my hip, goes everywhere I go, is serving its purpose all the time. It spends more time on me than I have ever spent in a car. 
Uh, you say that uh, about 2130, I'm sorry, that was a 1611, about 2130 you say uh, you think owning a firearm should be a privilege rather than a right. Uh, that will never uh, happen so long as I draw a breath. Best of luck. 2140, you say that it makes sense that leaders in the past have taken firearms to take over people and that leaders in the future might do it as well, but this is a fear tactic. Uh, um, it, no, it, uh, wait, yeah, did I read that right? Leaders in the past have taken firearms to take over people. Uh, leaders in the future might do it as well, but this... You, no, it's not a fear tactic. This is not an argumentum ad metum. I'm not deceiving people about the future. I pointed out that there is the potential for these things to arise here in the future, and no one can guarantee otherwise. It is a risk that no one can quantify. I don't know of any perfect predictor of the future, uh, but I do know of some imperfect ones, and the best one is history. Uh, I know of no superior way to judge the future but uh, through the lens of the past, imperfect though it is. And anyone who wants uh, someone to entertain a proposition that runs anything like the following, anything even remotely similar to this, uh, the argument would go something like, uh, things that have happened in the past, you know, you can see, you can see to that, uh, things that are happening this very moment, in the world, right now, this second, uh, not a serious risk to be, uh, to be contemplated for the future. Uh, anyone who pro proposes anything like that is an idiot who doesn't need to be taken seriously. I'm not fear-mongering. I'm trying to have a sober discussion about potential risks that no one can quantify. Uh, the future is murky to all of us. These are risks. It has happened in the past, indeed in this country. Uh, I have, recently in this country, by the way, and I have no reason to suppose that it won't happen in the future, and no one can make that guarantee. Um, we all take steps today to prepare ourselves for unknown risks in the future. Well, we don't all. Uh, those who don't do so at their own hazard, at their own risk. Because when and if any of these occasions arise in the future, you can only address them by what you have prepared in, then in the past, uh, to have at hand in order to address them. It is a very inconvenient position to realize you're now in a situation where you require X, Y, or Z item, only to, to discover that you've shot yourself in the foot, metaphorically, because you discarded X, Y, or Z item. I'm arguing don't discard X, Y, or Z item uh, on the false promises of, of a better tomorrow. Um, anyway, you claim that this is... Um, uh, oh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. No, um, post hoc ergo propter hoc is a confusion between precedence and cause. I haven't said that the one... Th oh, intervening fact here. Uh, that the argument runs that all tyrants seek to disarm those who they seek to oppress. The argument doesn't run that all people who are disarmed are going to be oppressed by tyrants. Uh, so in other words, the disarming is a necessary but not sufficient condition. So don't don't confuse the two. And uh, also, I'll take no lecture from you or, or anybody else on, on logic. You're not qualified to lecture me on logic. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, about 24 minutes in, you point out that there are a few countries, uh, you, you list off a few countries uh, that America undeniably has less restrictive laws with respect to and that uh, those countries that you enumerated have better gun crime rates. Uh, I also notice that you failed to point out that throughout the world, if ranked from highest to lowest, the United States is actually 111th on the list. Uh, and if you rank it the other way, it's 108th on the list for its homicide rate. Um, so in other words, there are 110 countries that have higher homicide rates than the United States. In that list, you have mixtures of very strict gun laws, and uh, some not so strict gun laws. Uh, so, in other words, having strict gun laws is uh, not a necessary condition to a low murder rate, nor is it a sufficient condition for a low murder rate. Um, and then you claim that these places aren't oppressed, overthrown hell holes. Uh, among the, the list of countries you rattled off, I called the names of England, France, Germany, Japan, and if you look on, like, uh, Freedom Indexes, um, uh, well, let me read what I've written before this. I said, I also note that, uh, that in none of these countries uh, that you, you list, do they have more freedoms than American citizens. And when we have an equivalent type of freedom, the citizens in none of those countries enjoy them to the same extent that Americans do. 
Um, for example, one of the fundamentals of the American justice system is that each defendant has an absolute right to a jury of his peers in a fair, impartial public trial. Not true in England. Not true in Japan. Um, uh, you know, you, you talk about, the, uh, speaking of which, in Japan and France, uh, the judges can take, they can be partisans in the, leg in the criminal prosecution against you. So if, uh, you know, that is to say that they can join in on the prosecution side to bring the case against you, and then after they've presented it with the prosecution, they get to jump back across the, uh, across the bench, sit down, and they'd be a judge of how good of a job the prosecution did. It shouldn't be surprising that in a country like Japan where they can do this, uh, almost no one is ever found not guilty. I guess the Japanese criminal investigators are much better. I mean, would that, would that it were the case that American investigators were as good as the Japanese? The Japanese always accuse guilty people. They almost never accuse an innocent person. Mirabile dictu, how could this possibly be? Oh, you don't have a jury trial. The judge gets to be a partisan in the legal proceedings against you with the promise that he will be fair to you, we, we swear. Uh, something like uh, less than, than it, it's, a, it's not even in the percentage, it's in the percent of a percent of cases do they acquit someone. And generally it's for political reasons. Uh, you you got to hand it to those Japanese. They are very efficient. Uh, you know, in Germany, uh, you, you can't, you, it is unlawful to speak the wrong version of German history. You can be imprisoned for it. You can be imprisoned for saying polite things about the wrong characters from history. In England, they're able to censor the, the media. You have internet censorship all throughout Europe in ways that if it were tried in the United States, there would be an uproar. Um, so, yeah, these countries are being treated, the citizens of these countries, by and large, are being treated reasonably well. None of them enjoys the freedoms that American citizens do. There is no country uh, in on this planet that now or has ever enjoyed the freedoms that American citizens enjoy, and to the same extent that we enjoy them. You look at the they'll rank uh, countries, um, you know, on freedom, uh, some kind of freedom index, and you'll see uh, places up there like Hong Kong. Really, Hong Kong is a freer country than the United States. Please. In Hong Kong, uh, you are presumed innocent unless the government makes an exception. Uh, you know, they have forced labor there. It's legal to discriminate against women there. Don't tell me that that is a freedom. That is, uh, you know, that that is a bastion of freedom. They, uh, you don't have a right to peacefully assemble. You, they can censor the internet. They don't have free speech rights in the same way the United States does. Uh, you, you know, look at the Netherlands. Uh, you have a guy there who, by its constitution, can do no wrong. If the king screws the pooch, he can't be blamed. It's one of the minister's fault. The king is inviolate. He can do no wrong. Speaking of which, the, uh, the United Kingdom doesn't even have a constitution. It, it has traditions that are called the constitution that aren't obligatory. That's why you don't have a right to a jury trial in the United Kingdom if the judge decides that you're not entitled to it. It's because there isn't a constitution that people can invoke in law. They have something called parliamentary supremacy. The so-called rights that the British citizens, formerly subjects, enjoy exist exclusively at, at legislative grace. The legislature can abolish or grant rights. On, we'll grant them on Monday, abolish them on Tuesday, regrant them on Wednesday, abolish them on Thursday if they want to. Now, as a practical matter, they probably won't, which just makes the citizens of the United Kingdom lucky not free. Um, do, 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 do. So, uh, anyway, as, as uh, you were talking, I wrote a list. They variously have official state religions, religious officials who, in their religious capacity, sit in the legislature and, and uh, try to get their religious doctrines codified into law uh, to be made applicable to the citizens. Uh, they have official churches. Uh, you, you, some of them you have to pay taxes to the church. You have to swear allegiance to the church. Uh, you know, no constitutional rights. I'm not saying this. Uh, each one of these applies in every country you listed, or in all these other countries. I'm saying you know, in various countries, you get various combinations of these types of things. Uh, denial of a right to have a jury. Indeed, judges who serve as both part of the prosecution and the jury and the judge, which isn't both. That's three. But anyway, 
uh, laws prohibiting, contradicting the official state version of history, criminal penalties for insulting religions, censorship over the in internet, hate, spe hate speech uh, crimes. N none of that do you have in the United States for all of our problems. 2741, you took, the, you took a issue with my distinction between a right and a privilege and adverted to my earlier saying that food and air aren't guaranteed rights. Uh, you apparently forgot that I mentioned the Bill of Rights uh, are there uh, because those are what tyrants historically go after. These are the things that tyrants always go after or almost always go after. And uh, so while we're on the Bill of Rights, you have that pesky Ninth Amendment which says, uh, as a cautionary tale to people like you, uh, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. You're conflating a right with a constitutional right. These aren't the same things. So, uh, Second Amendment's a constitutional right, but uh, it, apart from that, it is also a freestanding right. And indeed, the Constitution, contrary to what a lot of people says, say, did not grant these rights to the American citizens. These are rights that the Constitution codifies. They pre-exist the Constitution. It's not... The, the constitutional provision doesn't say uh, they shall have the right to freedom of speech or make no law abridging the freedom uh, abridging freedom of speech. It says the freedom of speech. It refers to a particular thing that predated the existence of our country and predated the existence of our constitution. It's the right to keep and bear arms. It is a pre-existing right with some modifications made when incorporated into the American system. These things uh, don't depend on their, the, the Constitution for their existence, though that is the legal instrument by which we uh, seek to have them vindicated in the course of law. It is well understood, and indeed this country was founded uh, because the citizens had their rights. And in fact, for people you know who don't know their history, um, what started, what was the event that was the shot heard around the world that kicked off our Revolutionary War? It was when Thomas... Uh, Thomas Gage marched on Lexington and Concord to do what? To seize the arms of the, uh, the um, British subjects there. About 20 min 28 minutes in, you say there are uh, two conversations regards, uh, to, uh, in regards to my black people voting thing, uh, because that would be discriminatory. But then you say, but taking the same action for everyone would be fair. Well, it wouldn't be fair, though it would be equal. If I, if I go into a village and uh, murder everybody without respect to their religion or their creed or their color, uh, they've all gotten an equal amount of oppression. None of them has been treated fairly. Uh, so it doesn't become fair if you infringe on everyone's rights the same, though I will fully grant you're being a, you know, you're being an equal, you're, you're being a tyrant who is uh, interested in equally oppressing all of the peoples. Uh, 2921, you asked me if I just admitted the gun control laws worked in Australia. Um, because that's what it sounds like to you. No. Um, nice try to gotcha, though. If you'd actually go back and read the links that I left in the below bar in my previous video, you would have found a blurb in one of them where it says that the, the gun murder rate, the gun homicide rate in Australia, is continuing a trend that it started in 1969. I don't think you get to say that you get to come in nearly 30 years afterwards, write a law, and then claim credit for a trend that exceeded it, that preceded it by three decades. This is another confusion, conflation on your part between precedence and cause. Uh, you come in and you say, "Aha! This happened then, and since then X has hap or uh, X happened at a time period, you know, time equals whatever, and then at some later time event Y happens, therefore X causes Y." When in reality, the trend of Y started decades before and has continued with some fluctuation here and there. Moreover, only people like you are uh, interested in talking about just the gun homicide rate. Uh, I'm interested in, in all the homicides. I don't distinguish between uh, which group of people who have been murdered are really worth my attention. So, um, to, to focus, in other words, if you're going to say that that is a success, that you, uh, this trend line and the gun homicides in proportion to the number of homicides um, that have been perpetrated is a success, when they're not enjoying their lowest crime rate in their history, they had, uh, there were periods in its history where it had very lax gun laws and better murder rates than it has today. That is a bit like saying that if you can save one person from being shot by burning two people at the stake, that's a, that's a success. I consider that to be a failure. Uh, uh, 
And by the way, I would still consider it to be a failure if uh, you save one person from being shot to death who is, uh, you know, we have a corresponding other person who's burned to death. That would still be a failure. But uh, in your book, apparently, because you have mitigated a gun homicide, you have, you have done something successfully. Um, you mentioned that all the statistics show that the gun ban is causally, causally related to the reduction of gun homicides. This is false. If you, oh, yeah, I'm just saying this. Uh, the exact quote is, The percentage of homicides committed with a firearm continued a declining trend which began in 1969. Um, oh, real quick story about precedence and cause and uh, happenstance. When I was a little boy, about five or six, I used to think that candy was an efficacious cure for the cold or the flu, because when the season would come around, my grandmother would mail candy uh, to me, and she would do it to my brother and all the other grandkids, too. Now, we lived so far away, it took about three days for the candy to get, get to me, to get to us. So I'm three days into the sickness. You can probably see where this is going. She sent us about a four or five day supply. So by the time the candy had been finished being eaten, uh, the cold or the flu had also subsided, and it wasn't until I was about seven before I worked out that one wasn't a cause of the other. They just happened to occur in that particular way because my grandmother is clever. Um, so anyway, uh, you are correct about the buyback program here in that we've never really tried it. You're wrong that Australia tried it. There is no such thing as a government buyback of firearms. It is not possible to buy back a thing you did not previously own. Although maybe in Australia, you know, they decided to play with the definite, you know, in the English speaking world that statement is true. Maybe in Australia things were completely different. Um, and nor shall there ever be such a forced confiscation while I remain alive. 3347, you asked me if this is only a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun argument. No, I already addressed that earlier. Uh, it's one of the stupid things the NRA says. One way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. It is not the universal ways to stop them. It is effective. Uh, but there are other ways to do it. And for the same reason that you got me uh, on my guard when you said solely pr the sole purpose, uh, people like Wayne LaPierre also put me on my guard when they say things like, the only way, it's just false. And I don't brook a, uh, knowingly false arguments from anyone, no matter whether they agree with me uh, or not. Um, uh, 3422, you're joining on about the possibility of crossfire hitting an innocent person if everyone has a gun. This is a, uh, it is always a possibility when rounds are discharged that someone could inadvertently be hit. Uh, however, there you have the remote possibility of a person being inadvertently hit versus the certain probability of people being hit if the murderer is left to walk around continuing to murder uh, people. Also, um, I will take no lecture from you or anyone else about what it is like to be in a gun battle. I don't need a lecture from anybody on that. I know it quite well. And I don't need to imagine how people react in certain in various situations, uh, armed people, when gunfire breaks out. People who carry firearms do so for defense. And the people who do so for defense defense typically educate themselves on defense. But apparently in a dark theater, when the first bullet is discharged and the muzzle flash muzzle flash goes off, the people in, in the dark theater will be completely oblivious to that. But once people start shooting back, they'll notice that those gun flashes are going on and then they'll start shooting each other. This is one of the one of the, the uh, and things that comes up in the gun control argument a lot is that the, the uh, it is an inept citizenry, people who are just so fucking retarded that if, you know, if, if they didn't have people to hold their hands while they crossed the street, they'd wind up shooting themselves nine or ten times before they realized it hurt, and then they'd shoot themselves in the head. They're just that incompetent. Um, <clears throat> go watch the Senate hearings during the last uh, spate of gun control um, debates. Um, the common pitting of the problem arises in the following form. In the, Ga in the Gabby Gifford shooting, uh, there was a citizen who came out of the store, had his gun, and he almost shot the wrong person. That's one way to spin it. Another way to spin it is uh, to look at the complement of almost shot, which is to say, did not actually shoot. In other words, the citizen walked out in the midst of a gun uh, thing going on, 
correctly interpreted the situation and decided because he could not tell who the shooter was versus who was trying to fight with the shooter, it would not be justified to take the shot. He held his fire. In other words, this country bumpkin walking out of the stores, you know, just an ordinary non-trained cop, just a guy with a gun walking around, was able to uh, uh, correctly appreciate the situation and not do precisely what you want to introduce as the, the, the great concern, by the way, while whining about other people talking about peddling on fear. This is expressly talking about the fear of a remote possibility versus mitigating a definite risk, a definite likelihood. But anyway, putting it off to the side. One of the police chiefs, along with everybody else on the, the aisle, uh, on the Democrat side, was arguing, and he brought that up, we nearly had a catastrophe after this rampage. Nearly, but didn't. Meanwhile, that police chief, in his own department, had just had one of his officers unable to notice that he, one of his own co-workers, another cop, and then he shot and killed the other cop, because apparently he can't tell the cop from the robbers, uh, and that, for some inexplicable reason, is not an argument that would agitate for disarming the police. Because, after all, it's okay if the police shoot and kill the wrong people because they're so trigger-happy, they're trained professionals. But when citizens, in event after event, show that they are disciplined and hold their fire because they're reluctant to want to kill people, but will do it if necessary, that is presented as an argument for how inept they are. It is an inconsistent metric. You are worried about the fear that a citizen might make the wrong decision. If this was a problem, people like you would be saying, look here, look there, look at the other place. But you're not because it isn't. It is almost entirely imaginary. Um, 38 minutes in, you're talking about America's being number one in privately owned guns. Yes, I also noticed that we're number one in freedoms, power, importance, prestige, and wealth. Uh, curiously enough, though we're number one in the access uh, to these weapons to death, we're not number one in homicides, we're not number one in suicides, and we're not number one in accidents. In fact, ranked top to bottom, we're near the bottom, if you know, from worst to best, we're, you know, we're 111th from best to worst, we're 108th on, on the homicide thing. 4105, uh, you'd rather take your chances against a knife, you're welcome to it. Uh, I'm not interested in a fair fight. I'm always armed. Uh, whatever weapon someone comes through my door wielding, I know what the response is going to be. Gunfire. I don't care what they have. They could be carrying a pickle, disguised as something. They're dead. You come in my house unbidden, you better be eager, desperate to surrender immediately, or you better be very quick at running, because one or the other of us is going to be dead. Or uh, wishing we were. Uh, you you can go dream about having fair fights all you want. Not interested. Um, you say that the odds are better if the uh, person has the knife and uh, the uh, you know he doesn't have a gun and he's going after people. Perhaps, perhaps not. But uh, as you conceded in the the cop case, uh, if you walk in with a gun and there's a room full of people who are armed, it's suicide. Now you add the caveat there of trained. But why this logic wouldn't apply to a trained citizen, a citizenry is a complete mystery. If you walk into a building where everyone in there is armed, and some proportion of them are competent, uh, it is suicide to go in there and, and with any weapon and try to kill somebody, just like it would be in the cop case. I do note, uh, mass murders at NRA conventions and other gun conventions, very low. Indeed, I couldn't find one. Uh, you say the odds are much better, um, you know, t imagining uh, your particular case, the odds would be much better uh, based off of this. Look, it's an ecological fallacy. You, you can't say what might be generally the case based on what, what shakes out in statistics. Uh, you can't say that says nothing whatever about any particular case. It, it is fallacious. You cannot, in statistics, go from uh, this is true about a general population to this is true about any particular member of that population. It's just fallacious. Again, uh, you are in no position to lecture me on logic. Uh, 44 minutes in, about that, you uh, continue to fail to understand the laws on rape and murder. Uh, in that, because there's no right to rape, there's no right to murder, we want... Uh, those, those, those are malum and say laws. Those things are unlawful. 
because even absent uh, a law that criminalizes them, uh, they would still be stopped, people would still resist them, uh, they would always, in all circumstances, be wrong. Carrying a firearm is not in all circumstances wrong, indeed you have conceded this, there's no real point uh, uh, arguing against it, so if you want to analogize that to the other laws, then what you'd have to say is something along the lines of, um, it, possession of a firearm, just like in these other cases, there is no circumstance under which it is ever justified, so it would be unjustified for the cops. It would be wrong for the military to have firearms. It's wrong for me to have firearms. It's wrong for you to have firearms. It's wrong for your family who hunts to have firearms. It's wrong for your mother or your sister or your daughter to shoot at her rapist, her would-be rapist. That would be immoral if your mother defended herself with a firearm because it would be immoral for her to hold it in her hand and use it to stop a rapist in her own home. Your mother would be unethical to do that. 4622, what is the outcome if the bad guy had a knife? Uh, it, in that situation, it could have been different. Uh, what could have also made it different is if he'd walked in there and everybody else was armed, just like in the police case, you've conceded that there's no real point in uh, arguing about it. Um, uh, 48N, uh, yes, it doesn't necessarily follow, whatever you were saying. Uh, murders will happen, this is, this, is, this is conceded by all. So the only thing to be argued is how, not if, people will be murdered. Whenever you have less efficient uh, means of killing, you have more torturous means of killing. Um, and as I pointed out, and you continue not to notice, uh, if you write these laws that dispossess people of firearms, you have only necessarily disarmed uh, the would-be victims. You cannot guarantee that you've disarmed the criminals. Uh, so in other words, you're, you're saying, well, if we disarm the criminals, yes, if you in fact disarm the criminals, that's one state of affairs. But you can't guarantee that. Um, uh, you keep talking. Uh, you keep mentioning all the features of firearms that makes them precisely useful, no matter who's wielding them. It is an equalizer. Um, a five foot two woman who's seventy five pounds or eighty five or whatever it is is just as able to defend herself against a guy who's six feet tall, two hundred eighty five pounds, as the other way around. Um, 53 minutes in, I wrote a note about the Battle of Athens, Connecticut and Washington State. So this is presumably about um, citizens rising up against a, a tyranny in a government, or Hitler, or something, something along those lines. In the Battle of Athens, uh, you had a county sheriff who uh, stole the election, literally. He shot, well, after shooting the citizen, after having a citizen shot, so he, uh, he steals the ballots. He and his deputies, about 200 of them from surrounding communities, they abscond with the ballots to, to count them in secret to show that he had won election again. And some uh, some citizens there decided, no, we just got back from fighting the Nazis, bitch. We're not having this shit. This is after a decade of the federal government and the state governments doing absolutely fuck all to help the citizens of this community against their, um, their, uh, their local tyrant. So anyway... They went uh, with their own arms and some that they procured by raiding the National Guard armory, set siege to the town against the, uh, the corrupt sheriff and his, his lackeys, and eventually, after a several hours long gun battle, the uh, veterans and citizens, whoever they were, I think were the veteran, was the veterans, uh, they used the explosives they got from the National Guard armory, re conveniently removed the front of the building where the ballots were being held hostage, stormed the, uh, the, the beaches of Athens, uh, they went into the jail and liberated uh, their ballots and counted them, and, you know, surprise, surprise, the sheriff lost. Uh, the National Guard was called up, and then the governor or ordered them to stay out of Athens to let the people there handle it, since they were handling it. Um, in Connecticut, a couple of years ago, uh, the Connecticut government wanted to uh, have a forced registration or forced confiscation. The state patrol was talking a lot of smack about going door to door. Uh, there are a lot of concerned citizens. Two thirds of the gun owners there have said, "Fuck you! We won't do you. We won't do what you tell us to." Um, and the state patrols, the state police response was, "Well, this will be a felony." To which the citizens of the good citizens of the uh, the great state of Connecticut, uh, to include about sixty for sixty six or so percent of the law enforcement who refused to comply with the law, essentially said to the state, "We're calling your bluff. If you're going to go door to door, start it today. We'll meet you when you get here. Bring it, state." And uh, the state wisely backed down immediately. In my neck of the woods, 
there was a, a town that uh, wrote a law prohibiting firearms in public places, which uh, in my state that's unlawful. Um, this isn't one of those, if you, if you interpret a law one way, it, it, it will allow one thing. If you interpret it the other way, it will allow the opposite. There's an absolute prohibition in my state against local governments writing gun laws. They can't do it. it is, they are denied all power on that. Uh, so they're just not able to make those ordinances, period. Or at least relevant here, they're not able to make those ordinances, period. Uh, the city attorney told the city council, this is unlawful, you can't do it. It is beyond the power of the city. You can't do it. The mayor said we can't do this. Anyway, so um, after one of the city council members ran like a, a pussy because an armed citizen came in, he had a concealed weapon. By the way, you never know who's carrying concealed. That's a use, even though it's not being shot at the moment, but whatever. Uh, when the city councilman uh, learned that the guy actually had a concealed weapon, he wanted the cops to come in and, and remove the guy. Um, I can just tell you that the cops weren't going to remove that guy. Uh, but there was a, um, the city council, I'm sorry, the city attorney told the council member that you can't do it, anyway, whatever. So the city councilman says, well, Mr. Mayor, I don't feel comfortable being here, fine, get out. So he runs away. Uh, the next meeting, um, more citizens, two or three more citizens, several, many, okay, a lot of citizens showed up. And they weren't carrying concealed weapons. They were just carrying their weapons and they marched into the city council like they owned the place and they had a sit down talking to with the city council about uh, we're going to try, you know, we're going to sue you and it's going to cost the city a lot of money when you lose. If you lose, you'll lose, but say you don't. Uh, suppose that the, the courts decide not to en enforce the, uh, the dep you know, not, not to overturn this because they too have decided to collude with you in some way in usurping our liberties. Look around this room, city council, if you think that this law is going to run against us, you had better think again, because um, it will not work out in your favor. So, uh, we advise you, politely, but sternly, to uh, reverse this ordinance immediately. And the, the ordinance was reversed, in short order, moments later. So I don't remember exactly what you said when I wrote that down, but it's that kind of argument. These things, well, the Battle of Athens didn't make national news. Uh, these other things, they don't tend to make national news um, because the media likes to, generally likes uh, certain kinds of stories. Uh, if it bleeds, it leads. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And citizens standing up for their liberties, you know, grabbing their guns and going in and confronting their government uh, when the government backs down doesn't make for a good story. And so it doesn't get told. And unless you sit around and you pay attention to these things, you'll be picking shit ignorant of them. Which uh, gun control advocates generally make it a point to be picking shit ignorant about uh, all the things they talk about. Alright, you guys have a great day.